Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Happy beginning of the week. We're back with Joe Allen. Hello, Joe. Hello, um, hello. How's it going? Hope everyone's doing well. Yes, I hope you had a nice weekend. And we gonna talk about YouTube again. We did that a little while back, talking about how to set up a channel, what are the important things to keep in mind. I think, when was that? Two or three weeks ago? Uh, um, you know, I think it's actually a little bit longer than that. Even and, that, uh, oh, It feels just, like it's only been a week or so. Yeah, time just goes month, by. Or maybe more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> could have been could have been a few months, could have been a few weeks. But if you want to check that out, you can find it on YouTube. Um, if you want to see the first part of this um, two-part series, I think it's only going to be two parts, um, of us talking about YouTube. And today it's going to be about the how you create your thumbnails and also a little bit of the ins and outs of the back end of a YouTube channel. Am I right? Yeah. So uh, I've got a few things to cover here. Uh, so there's obviously some like artwork stuff and uh, we spent a bit of time in Photoshop and uh, I'll run through uh, some of my magic on creating multiple variations of very similar assets um, mm -hmm. is something that uh, I'm very proud of as a workflow and uh, I want to share with you today. And then going into some of the more technical side on YouTube uh, with some of the sort of backend analytics and uh, things to look yeah. at and um, a lot of data that I've captured and Wonderful. if we're nerdy, we might enjoy it. Yes. So I want to say hi quickly to our lovely community in the chat. If you're watching on YouTube right now, we're over at Behance and we have a chat there. If you have any questions, just ask. And we already have some lovely people in the chat. We have Sandrine, we have Sean, we have Andreas, Jackie. Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. I hope you enjoy. And if you have any question um about youtube or anything about joe's work just ask in the chat and i'll pass it along so i would say let's start yeah all right uh well, i guess we can we can probably start off in uh in the browser actually um hopefully you can see this i can't actually see a preview of what's yes. happening so i'm just gonna run with yes, it and uh, it. Mm -hmm. yeah cool um so uh, this is, of course, uh, my channel. If you've never come across it, uh, I create videos about travel photography uh, and filmmaking, um, and I cover a whole breadth of things um, kind of related about being what I call myself as an independent creative. Um, so in a usual year, I'll be out and about traveling, uh, taking photos, documenting journeys, and um, kind of showing the process behind the scenes of creating that. Uh, creative content and uh, this is how the channel looks of course when you uh, first join there's a banner image which is what we're going to work on starting with um, today and then the uh, thumbnails and these collectively the two combined are the first interaction that someone has with your channel of course um, so there is a huge amount of um, sort of requirement oh I don't want to play that. Uh, there's a huge amount of requirement to make this consistent and to have all of this uh, come through and, you know, tell a good story of who you are before anyone's ever clicked on anything. Uh, yeah. So no pressure, but there's a lot of weight yeah. on that. It's like, I think maybe people don't even uh, take that into consideration because when you think about YouTube, you think about, yeah, I'm just going to create video content. And then if you actually take a step back it's so important so because there's so many videos how do people decide on what video to click then you mm -hmm. need image you need like photos or assets to then have thumbnails to have a title photo to that is the gate into your channel basically into your content so people look at that first before they even see your video so it is quite important Definitely. to have that no uh, I don't know if there's any any sort of like hard and fast metric for it, but mm. the the amount of weight that is applied to a thumbnail alone is just immense. Uh, it yeah. stresses me out no end. Uh, so <laughs> what I want to share with you today, uh, there's no such like, you know, as I said, there's no like hard and fast rule on, on anything with this. Um, it is all an experimental science and a lot of it, um, you either think of it kind of emotionally or statistically, um, but either way, 
the end goal is that you want to create something that doesn't, you know, doesn't lie about what the video is, but at the same time pique someone's interest. Yeah, so yeah. I always like to think of them as headlines. Um, and, uh, you know, you work with that headline as both a visual impact with the thumbnail and also as the titling. And um, yeah, we piece it together. So uh, what we're going to look at today is, um, first of all, the artwork here. So this is kind of your your sort of official branding as such um, for the channel and your uh, appearance of things. And one thing that you need to bear in mind with this is that this needs to work across multiple devices. So of course, we're looking at this on desktop here. But if you were to use this on a tablet device, you would have a smaller window such as this, mm -hmm. uh, right the way down to mobile. And you see at the moment that it's just appearing very much the same, but scaling down. Um, but if you open that same piece of artwork on an iPad or on your smartphone in the YouTube app, you'll see that it actually crops in your artwork very differently. So we need to bear in mind with that. Uh, and likewise, another place that uh, you need to look at for this is on something like an Apple TV um, or on a Chromecast where you have the full 16 by 9 uh, artwork available for the whole channel. So this is actually how that artwork looks. Uh, so in Photoshop here, this is a full 16 by 9 image and uh, we've got a lot of uh, space to play with things. But in reality, we only actually have these internal areas here to work with on desktop and then these slightly smaller, actually I've got a guide here, uh, these uh, slightly smaller areas here for tablet devices um, and then the minimum on smaller desktops and mobile devices. So you see that that one piece of artwork has to work across multiple devices and um, you know there's a lot of consideration to take in there. Uh, this is how my channel artwork currently looks but I wanted to improve on it and update things uh, for new sort of directions that I'm taking the channel in terms of its sort of branding and, and visual look. Uh, I've had this kind of red style and whatever for the last uh, three, uh, I don't know, maybe five years or so now. Um, so it's something to to improve upon. And uh, I've just kind of changed the artwork and just tidied up the text and whatever uh, over the years. So I've created some new versions. And if we go into my layer comps here, and this is where the magic starts on yeah. multiple asset creation. Uh, so if you're new to layer comps, they are just pure wizardry um, for <laughs> Photoshop. Layer comps, uh, if you go into your window and open layer comps, uh, save it into a workspace because honestly, once you start to know about them, you will use them all of the time. And it still surprises me how many people don't use layer comps. So layer comps are a way of saving your um, current state of the document. So if we think of all of our layers here and what we have active, I've got various folders, text layers, um, images and all sorts of things uh, available. And I can create a layer comp, in which case I've already got this one, where it mm -hmm. saves that state of the document. So it says, remember all of those layers that you had active, let's save that. So that if we then go and change some things and we turn on all sorts of other stuff and kind of mess around with things, we can always click back in our layer comps to that previously saved state. So of course you can then take that further and you can create different options. So I can create a new one, which is where I've created uh, a different save state of new text. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom here, I can just click save uh, new layer comp, give it a name. I'm only saving the layer visibility. You can also save the uh, position of where the layers are and you can save the appearance style. And that starts to get a little bit more complex. Mm -hmm. But I would say that if you're new to layer comps, this is somewhere that you maybe don't want to explore too far too fast. Um, that's not a sequel to <laughs> another Fast and Furious film. <laughs> uh, just stick with visibility. That's a, a great option to um, just get an understanding of what layer comps is doing first and foremost. Yeah. Um, so I've got a few different options here. Um, so I've started to use yellow a lot more in my titles within the videos and within the thumbnails. Um, and I'm unsure if I want to include those in my um, channel artwork or not, but we'll we'll see how it goes. Um, and I've got options with the white ones, and I've got some left aligned and right aligned, and ones that are kind of yeah. pulling in some more of the branding that I've got going on um, throughout the channel. So we've saved 
uh, we've got our layer comps created and we've saved them. What I'll do is I'll then uh, shift click all of these. If I can hold shift and the right button, can't see it, microphone's in the way. Um, so select all of these and then go to file, export, and then layer comps to files. When I discovered this action, uh, I think it was about 10 years ago now, it blew my mind. Uh, and this was at a time when I was um, working on multiple pieces of artwork for multiple languages. Uh, think things like uh, desktop wallpapers for mm -hmm. movies that had multiple languages, multiple characters, multiple variations. Before you know it, just the 23 languages for Europe alone, it created, uh, I think, a thousand or 1500 options that I had to create for uh, wallpapers and all the different file sizes and device sizes anyone who is doing this normally who would you know enable their layers go to file save as and then mm -hmm. export it as a jpeg or whatever mm -hmm. and then the marketing team would come back to you and they'd say hey uh you know how you got this left aligned can we have it right aligned we've uh realized that it works better for um you know certain markets you think yep i can go and do that mm -hmm. and uh let me go, go and back save. and do it all again <laughs> Yeah, um, so that idea got tiring very quickly and uh, I, I went about a mission to find a much better way of doing that. And layer comps has been my answer to that um, and I love it so much. So I can do file, export and then layer comps to files. You've also got the option here, layer comps to PDF if you want to create a booklet of all of those. Uh, but layer comps to files is the magic one. And uh, choose our destination and here is one of my hot tips is create yourself an export bin which sits in finder and i've got it saved as a favorite here and my export bin is just a location where um, i just store things that get exported from various different applications so that if i leave that as the default option i know that when i export something it's always going to be in my export bin no matter what and then from there that's where i can file manage it and organize it the reason that i do this is because if you always chose your project folder at this level. Sometimes when you're in a rush and you're in a hurry and you export something on a later project and you're like, where did it go? And you haven't realized that you didn't change the destination. It's gone to your old project or it's gone onto the server or it's gone somewhere else that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so set yourself an export bin and I've gone one step further and created a, uh, a directory just for specific applications. Uh, you can add a prefix to the file. So that would be um, before the name over here, uh, but otherwise it's going to use the layer comp name as the file name. Uh, so it's good to get into a good practice with uh, your file naming of things and uh, choose your file format. So we've got all sorts of different options here. Um, for this one, because it's kind of photo heavy and I need it to be a certain size uh, as in file size, I'm going for JPEG um, and I'm setting the quality to 10. I found that 10 works generally best uh, there's no visual quality loss um, that I can see on things like YouTube and YouTube is quite commonly uh, restricting file size uploads. So things like thumbnails can only be two megabytes in size mm. and um, I think channel artwork might be a little bit more. So uh, we have this all set and I'm going to do selected layer comps only but I've selected all of them so either way it doesn't matter. Hit run and you'll see that my export bin now starts to fill with all of those images. And Does that mean you export all of them or do you use the layer comps to click through the different options just to make it easier to see them like back to back and then you export the one that you like or do you always export everyone like all the layers you have and then decide what so to use in the end? Generally, I create all the versions that, I, um, that I'm sort of working with and thinking with as an idea and then I will export all of them. But if I then come back and let's say I look at this one and I think, you know what, I actually want to put the logo over to the left mm. and I want to do this one and move that there. If I then select this layer comp again, I would then, because that's the only one that I know that I've made changes to, yeah, I'll export just that one layer comp. And again, selected layer comp, I've only got the one selected anyway, Yeah, hit run that finishes immediately and what I love about this process is it actually overwrites the thing so that way you can always have your most up-to-date export here that's um, good yeah so you're, you're not going to lose yourself on accidentally doing that version that marketing asked that was left aligned 
And then yeah. Dave from sales came over and said, actually, we need to do right aligned. Um, and uh, you, That's you know, true. you put the wrong one out. So this is a, a great way of making sure that layer comps is truth and whatever you've got saved here and exported, that is all that exists. Uh, and then from here, I can, yep. you know, keep my, uh, my file naming pretty standardized and structured and uh, it works really well. Uh, so I'm actually going to undo that because I did prefer the logo over on that side. So let's export new layer comp to file, um, click run. And this is fast as well. Um, it's It runs through uh, all the images like super fast. Uh, it can be a little bit yeah. slower on other file types, um, but either way, I found it to be just hugely um, time saving. And if you think if you were doing a thousand or so images and all sorts of wallpapers and, you know, whatever artworking that you're working on, it may not even be a YouTube channel. You could just be doing something else. Um, yeah. You lose so much time just on admin. <laughs> it's boring. Oh, yes. We hate it. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so let's just go and I'm just going to update this here because yes. it's something that I've been meaning to do for a while. So um, there we and go. Six megabytes. Why not do it live in front of people? You know, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so it was this one. So I'm going to go for that. And you can see here, this is where YouTube's telling us um, this is how things would be yeah. viewable on TV devices, desktop and uh, tablet and mobile. And hit publish. And so now, when was the last time you updated it? You said like three or five years ago? You know, uh, sometime, some years ago? I think I think I last updated it in January 2019 um, to have like a, a simplified titling. Uh, I changed the font around that time, I guess. Um, but in terms of having like the red sort of like banner tab and that sort of format, I think I've had since about 2015. Wow. Um, so there we go. We've got a new um, updated banner image. And the idea with this is that I just wanted to celebrate a little bit more strongly of what the channel is about, yet still keeping it kind of clean um, and just upgrading it. And whether it makes a massive impact or not, um, in terms of new viewers, I mean, they didn't know the old one. They don't know that this is a new one. But for me, when I look at it, I feel refreshed. And that kind of gets me more um, interested in wanting to work on this and, and work forward. Yeah. So I take that as a good win. Uh, it's a little yeah. bit like buying a new camera. When you get a new <laughs> camera, the new camera doesn't necessarily take better photos, but because you're excited to use it and play with it, um, you'll potentially get more from it. Yeah. Yeah. I also do you think but I guess it's about finding the middle ground of like, don't change all your assets and visuals all the time because then people don't recognize it's your work, but it's also okay to change your branding and your title image, even though that is one of the first images people see when they go onto your channel. Like, it's okay to do that whenever you maybe feel like you need a change or if you change directions or you want to do something differently. Would yeah, I think... Um... I think one of the things with with branding, um, especially when it comes to like a personal brand, is well, I, I guess it, it it can go both ways. But um, you could either go all out and do a complete re-image of everything, and it's kind of like a, a bit of a shock and awe system, where it's like, whoa, this is new, everything's different, everything's changed. Um, but what I found it to be more sort of successful. Uh, long-term wise over things is to do the slow evolution of stuff mm. and you see this in brands all the time um i mean take uh, a company like apple for example they're making products they're making um you know various sort of online services and they've got style guides of all things when they start to release things they don't update everything all at once they'll do incremental changes on stuff and i take the same approach with branding on things so where i've uh, started to incorporate a lot of the like yellow titling in things uh, i did that through titles within the videos themselves and then on the thumbnail so some ideas like this and this has been over the last where you can see here four months ago is when i first sort of started doing it and i really enjoyed it i liked how it was looking and i felt like that was something that was working uh, good for the channel and I'm 
taking that sort of style guide slowly, even to the point now that I've, I've, I'm going for these, you know, the big typography, and I will then potentially move over to the yellow. I'm not sure I'm ready for the yellow just yet as a as an overall branding, mm -hmm. uh, because I do also have to tie it in with my website design, which is also due for an update. Um, and until those things start to kind of like come together a little bit closer, uh, I'm going to try and keep the um, keep the connection alive in some way. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, one question, the title photo, I mean, it is kind of in the word, it's always a photo, you cannot have a moving image as your title. Yeah, it's YouTube. just a photo. Um, yeah. That would be cool if you could have a, a moving image. Uh, like I mm -hmm. think on Facebook profiles, you could have a moving yeah, I think so too. Yeah. profile picture, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, it'd be great if you could upload a, a GIF or something. That would be great. Yeah. Um, I guess the way that YouTube think of it is you do have this ability to set a channel trailer, and that yeah. is the video that is uh, that auto plays when the um, when the page loads. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's also another great place to uh, to sort of like add your branding of things, and you can um, you can work with you know, a short form video that tells the story of your channel or maybe one of your favorite videos or channel that best describes you. Uh, set that up as a trailer and that's a, a great sort of first impression. Yeah. Um, cool. So that was uh, a quick look into channel artwork. Um, and by the way, these guides here with the, um, the sort of safe areas, you can actually download those from the uh from youtube's like health system i can't remember what it's called um but when we went into upload there was an option there there was a link that you could um you could go and download it and uh, they've got all the support documents for you and then i've just added in all the guides that i need uh, around that That's so great. let's let's move on Ooh. are these two thumbnails you had there like the photo we see right now uh, so this is a thumbnail design. Um, I'm going to turn on, why can't I get rid of that? Let's turn on this, keep getting notifications for everything. <laughs> um, so the, the image we're looking at here is, uh, an option that I had for a live stream setup, uh, video that I made. And, uh, this is a, a video that, um, ties in quite nicely with Adobe live. Cause obviously I've been doing these streams for almost a year now mm -hmm. and, um, you know, been running through a lot and the setup has evolved and changed and got involved with uh, all sorts of different gear and testing things. And I made a video that showed that sort of um, end result of things. And as I mentioned in the uh, the previous video that we did, a lot of what I'm looking to work on more is telling the story of things, showing more of the process. And this is a video that is probably a good example of where I failed at that because what i actually did is i showed the end result i showed the the finishing piece and i didn't really bring people along for the journey and so where i was uh publishing this video and uh when did i publish it four months ago or so um i uh, actually no it wasn't four months ago it was about two months ago uh so where i was uh publishing this video <laughs> it didn't really garner much attention from my uh, existing mm -hmm. audience which was a little bit um sad at times because you know you you put so much effort into making a video but at the same time i can understand that it's maybe not something that i'm necessarily known for because i'm quite often out and about traveling and, and making photo vlogs and stuff but it was something that i was very proud of and i knew that there were so many so many tips of gold in there uh, on cable management on uh setting up of things and just stuff that in the past, I've had great response from the audience and I compiled it all together in this video. Um, and a lot of the the sort of slow uptake uh, I put down to the fact that I'd probably given it a bit of a boring title and the thumbnail wasn't that great. Um, and I create multiple variations of my thumbnail designs um, every video, sometimes upwards of about 40, 50 variations. And using layer comps makes it super easy because um, I can go through and I've got all these ones here. I think originally I did something like this as the um, the thumbnail. Mm -hmm. And so it's tying in this iPad controller that I've built, uh, which gives me all the controls for the live stream 
uh, actions and things and the a10 mini pro it's the hmi switcher that i'm using for multiple cameras and whatever uh, these are things that i'd researched very heavily when i was setting up my live stream so they felt very in tune with me of what a live stream was um, and i guess i forgot that the audience themselves they don't necessarily know about these products. They don't know what this is. So when they see that, to them, it that doesn't scream live stream setup. That just says colorful iPad toy. Um, so I think that was where I, I went wrong originally, where these things related very heavily to me, but they didn't necessarily relate to the audience. Um, in fact, I think one of the original ones, I didn't even have a picture of me in there. Uh, so then I added in me and, you know, speaking with the microphone synonymous as live streams, um, all these different options, different variations and uh, overlaying some of my diagrams of the stream. Uh, sometimes they can be a little bit cluttered and you don't really know if it fits everything uh, properly. And um, yeah, so everything, uh, all these different options, they can amount to a lot of confusion because you've got, I mean, how many do I have here? Uh, live stream setup. We're still going. So, live stream all the way there. Um, however many that is for variations, that is a lot of confusion. But at the same time, it's a lot of flexibility. And all that I'm doing is I'm just enabling uh, various different. Um, ooh, where is it? Uh, various different images and title options that I've created, and um, just kind of covering all bases really. And of course, we export all of these out and then you upload them to YouTube and um, you just let it sit for a little while and you see what works and what doesn't. Um, in the end, yes. yep, go on. I just wanted to squeeze in a question. It's not 100% on topic, but I want to ask it before the chat goes on and I can't find it anymore. Stuart asked, um, how does Joe deal with multiple social platforms um, and if you use artboards? Um, yep. Uh, then, so yeah, that is a, a great question. And, uh, you might have already seen up here. So we've got one here for Instagram stories, which I use to promote the same videos. Um, I could go and create artboards instead of just working on this, this single artboard here. What I found though, uh, it may be different now that I'm, uh, I'm using an M1 Mac and Photoshop is, is rapid on the M1. Uh, but what I found in the past is that as you start to make these files bigger and bigger and you can see that I'm adding in 40, 50 different options and variations and I'll do multiple videos within this thumbnail. So this isn't just a, a file for my live stream setup. This is a file for multiple video options that I've got um, and I'll probably create maybe four volumes throughout the year. So this is my 2021 volume one and um, yeah, as the file gets too big, and things start to get slow, then I'm like, right, it's time to create a new file. Uh, I'll come back to the art builds in a minute. But the reason that I have them set up as files like this is because if ever I needed to mass update all of my thumbnails, having them in as few files as possible makes it so easy to then just go and rapidly export them and um, you've got them readily available. Whereas if I had to open up a PSD for every individual video, likewise, uh, if the thumbnail dimensions ever changed and I don't see that happening on YouTube I think they're going to stick with 16 by 9 um, but say for example you previously made all of your thumbnails at 720 and then later down the line the platform starts to support 4k images you would want to go and up res all of your images so having them in a single file means that you can just do a single action to up upscale the image and export them all out um, so all of that just amounts to trying to work cleverly, but also not slow yourself down by overboarding uh, or mm. overloading things. Um, so I, my artboarding, I still keep very separately as individual files. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I think there was a second part to that question, which I forgot, I think, maybe? Yeah, I, I think I forgot too. Um... Yeah, I think no. The question was like, if you, how do you deal with social di different social media platforms, and if you you'd use artboards for that, which I guess answered both questions. Like, uh, obviously, yeah, different just to, social medias have different measurements. You need to be aware of. Yeah, just to touch on on the extra social media stuff. Um, 
that's definitely something that can overwhelm you immediately. And if you're just starting out with, um, you know, a channel of some sort, maybe it's a company channel and you've been tasked with building this social presence on things, it can feel very overwhelming. You think like, oh, I've got to be on Instagram. I've got to be on Facebook. I've got to be posting on Pinterest. Um, I need to have a YouTube channel, Twitter. I need to be doing live streams. I need to be doing those things. Because there's so much, that doesn't mean that you need to do all of them. Uh, this is definitely something to build up as time goes on. And even for myself, I've been posting content online uh, for years and there are still destinations that I need to update better and, and be more active on. But at the same time, I don't see it as necessarily hurting me that I'm not posting actively on Pinterest, for example. Um, some platforms just find themselves better for you and the best platform to be on is the one that you're personally active on as well. Uh, so I'm not very active on Facebook at all. And so I don't really post to Facebook uh, because it just doesn't fit with me. It wouldn't feel natural. Uh, that, of course, is a bit different if you're a company and you've kind of got to have a bit of presence everywhere. Um, but I would say try and limit yourself originally, nail those things and then start to scale up um, beyond that. So for me, that's YouTube first and foremost, uh, and then Instagram and Twitter. Um, those are kind of my big sort of destinations of things. Yeah. I also think that makes sense in the way of like, if you enjoy these platforms, you can ask yourself, what would I like to see? And then create from that standpoint, then guessing what other people might want to see. If you like YouTube and you're a lot of on YouTube, you might know what you click on. Like what thumbnail would you find interesting if it wasn't your own video? I really like, I'm like, Personally, I try to think of what would I enjoy and then create from that more yeah. than what would others enjoy more because I think it's more authentic sometimes to think of mm -hmm. if I were a viewer of my work, what would I enjoy about it? Yeah. Um, I think long term that sets you up uh, the best as well because you will just yeah. continue in to enjoy it and um, yeah. you may not get the rapid traction that other channels uh, may get, but I do think overall long term is a far better strategy. Um, and that's definitely something that I've followed myself. Although I will also say <laughs> the amount of times where I've got the thumbnail and titling wrong because it's something that I personally thought fitted um, and was, you know, enjoyable and told the story of the video because when you upload the video, there's only one person who knows what the video is before you clicked it, and that's me. Yeah. So I know if the thumbnail tells the story of the video, but it's whether it's enticing enough for someone to find out if that's a video that they wanted to watch. Yeah. Um, so sometimes you do have to, you know, hold yourself back on things, as is the case with this live stream setup. Um, so in the end, we'll see that the, the thumbnail that I chose uh, looks like this. And I changed that about, uh, I think it was about two weeks later or so and it had a massive impact on the channel. It's a little bit heartbreaking because in some ways the video is so much more than just using a microphone. It's got so many more bits of information and tips and things like with the, the ATEM and the iPad switcher and just all the, the extra tech. But at the same time, what is most synonymous with live streams? And it's just someone talking with the microphone. So that's what people are going to click. The extra stuff that happens is just a bonus. Yeah. Um, and I can show that as well with the, the analytics. So when we come into uh, YouTube and you see the the new studio is great at showing all of the different um, stats and data for you. And from the time that it was published, uh, one of my favorite features of analytics is it shows this little window here of what uh, performance your video is doing based off of your previous trends uh, for the channel. So this gray area here is how your videos generally perform um, for the mm. same amount of time. And you can see that originally this blue line was very much under par for what the rest of the channel um, was doing. Still doing great as a video, but knowing how much time and effort I'd put into making it, I felt like there's, there's value here that I know people will enjoy if only they knew that they wanted to watch it. And that's, a, of course, a big ask to get people like you can't expect people to watch all your videos. But just knowing on previous 
videos and the engagement that I've had on certain things, I'm like, this is a video for you. I know, I know you're going to love this. Um, just bear with me, watch it and, and you will enjoy it. And um, I needed to change the thumbnail and titling to do that. I was trying to think back because I watched the live stream setup video immediately when you posted it. And I'm trying to wrap my head around if I still remember, if I even remember the thumbnail, but I thought it was your desk and we could see like your big computer and not, was that the first one? I don't know. Uh, just so that, that was the, that was the desk setup video. Um, oh, then it was that. Yeah. That so that one desk. did. That one did immediately very well, um, oh, and okay. that's a, a video format that I've uh, I've kind of revisited about four times now over the space of the channel. So it's something that is it's a bit of a, an anchor point that the um, uh, the viewers enjoy because they they see the evolution of the desk. And mm -hmm. naively, I thought that the live stream setup, which had a very similar format to the desk setup, um, I thought would attract the same sort of um, viewers. And I thought yeah. people would get just as much engagement from it. It's also an update to the desk because in that short time between doing the desk setup and the live stream, the desk setup changed, which yes. happens <laughs> so often. Yeah. Um, so there were there were updates to there and it was so much more than a live stream uh, setup video. But at the same time, it, it's so difficult when you're, you're covering so many bases on things like where do you label it? Where do you, you know, where do you yeah. hold strong on this is what the video is and this is the anchor point? Um, so anyway, yeah, you can see that I, I changed the thumbnail, I changed the title, and it had a drastic improvement on yeah. this video. It started to reach more audiences who were clicking through it and uh, getting more enjoyment from it. And it just shows that the power of a thumbnail yeah. and the title, I didn't really change the title all too much. I think I added um, Work From Home or WFH into the title. Um, because again, it's, it's not just a live stream setup. It's all about having a great setup that you can have meetings like this on you know skype zoom microsoft teams or whatever um and yeah just simple changes so i guess the point that i'm making in a very long roundabout way is that the uh the variety in thumbnails it's great to have all of these options because when you're doing these types of things and when you upload a video the first two hours of a video being live you can learn a lot. You just know if things are hitting or not. And this is where you need to be rapid. Um, and I guess what a lot of people don't realize is that when you publish videos on YouTube, so much work is done on the day of publish itself that is completely unrelated to editing the video at all. <laughs> There's so much in terms of preparation on uh, getting the video uploaded for one, um, doing all of your descriptions, your tag, your uh, marketing, your, you know, research into the topics and if this is a video that is going to fit in a certain way how is it going to compete against other people who've got similar videos um are you adding new things to the conversation are you adding or bringing up an old conversation in a new light like all these different things that are related to the um the sort of planning and pre-production of a video but then when you come to upload it on youtube you've already made the video and you you're now trying to tie it into what your planning was beforehand. Um, and then there's, of course, all the thumbnail creation, there's promotion across social media, um, all the different aspects of things. When you actually hit publish, your work isn't done. You've still got things to do. Um, you need to, you know, engage with the community who are active in your audience. And I've made great friends from people who comment frequently and who've been you know, active viewers over the years because it is a community focus. It may be my face in the video, but collectively, I always think of it as everyone together, um, you know, who just share a common interest across things that my videos happen to be about. So engaging with those audiences is, um, is great to do and promoting your videos across different platforms because you kind of have to tease it out across the internet. You have to push it and, um, and send it places. Uh, whether that's to Twitter, Instagram, or maybe if you want to post on Reddit and, you know, other places like that. Mm. So having all of these assets and thumbnail options, if you need to make a rapid change, you don't want to realize half an hour after uploading that, oh no, the uh, thumbnail's not working. I better create a new one. You want to have options available that you can just quickly replace. Um, so having all of these variations, uh, 
allowed me to um, just quickly change things and test things. And you can see almost in real time within those first two hours to then, uh, you know, you change the thumbnail and then you monitor it for the next, say, like four or five hours. You can see on the engagement, you can see the um, uh, the watch time on things. Where am I looking here? Uh, and the click through rate. So the click through rate adjusts and change over time. The longer this goes on, the more skewed it becomes because it starts to reach people outside of your audience. Mm -hmm. um, but almost immediately when it's only reaching the audience that you do have, then uh, having a higher click through rate is is very noticeable when it works and when it doesn't. Um, so yeah, making these question. changes. Yeah, go for it. Um, do you think, I mean, maybe there's also not a clear answer to it, but do you think the title or the thumbnail is more important or is it equally important or what, if a video is not going as you think it should, like knowing that your audience would enjoy the content, would you rather change the title first or the thumbnail or both? Um, just because maybe, or did you try both things and then see what worked better in the past? Like, how do you know what to change? Yeah, it's it's difficult because when you make too many changes, you don't know which one had the effect. Yeah. Um, you could change everything and then you're just as confused, <laughs> yeah. even if it works. Um, and to be fair, that is something that I've kind of been guilty of in the past where uh, I make too many changes and things work. But then you think like, well, can I can I repeat this? Is Is there a strategy to this or is this just is this luck. just luck and yeah. more magic um my personal preference is uh i mean i struggle with this because i'm probably one of the worst people as a user tester because i'm incredibly patient i will look through everything and i will read every word of everything so i i'm kind of not really a fair example um someone who is very impatient would maybe say the thumbnail because they never yeah. read the title, they don't care, they just click. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm probably more drawn to changing the thumbnail first. Um, but likewise, there are um, you know adjustments you can make with the titling of things. Um, you know, do you add in uh, certain keywords into your title, but then does it bloat it? Does it actually end up being um, truncated with an ellipses? And then it's like, well, you never actually read the full title until you click onto the video. Um, yeah, what has more impact? Is it maybe more uh, narrative, spoken, conversational titles, or is it more factual? Uh, and again, this is something that I struggle with and I'm always working on, and I'll create multiple variations of um, titling options, uh, and I'll save that with my my files on everything. Um, so in fact, I'm, let's see if I've got it available. Um, so... Oh, no, it's on my server. Will I find it in time? Uh, <laughs> let's just have a look at the uh, the different titling options. It's just, I find it so interesting because I, for some reason, always thought that, like, when I put a video on YouTube, which is like every once in a blue moon, um, is, is like you put it out and then it's out there. It's a bit like mm -hmm. if I post a photo on Instagram, I post it and then that's it. But having that mindset like i've never considered it and obviously now that kind of changed my changes my perspective of um you can go back and change that like you don't have mm -hmm. to put a video out there and be like well it's not going well damn yep. this one blows no you so, you um, can uh tweak you can that work hard to really it. yeah yeah definitely um yeah so these are just a few of the options that i had uh when i was creating the video um i would average between say uh, like five and about 15 different titling options. Um, all very similar, yet also having slight tweaks that can really change things. Um, and I think one of the things that I find amazing about humans and psychology is that it doesn't take much to have a big impact on us. Um, just a swap around of wording can drive things so differently. Um, and so I really enjoy the, the sort of science behind it all. Which yeah. is why coming on to my next thing, uh, which I'm potentially going to skim over because there's 
a lot here. <laughs> um, I I'm such a, a data nerd, and uh, I love going through all of the um, the sort of analytics on things. So of course, in YouTube, you have the ability to drive into your analytics, um, and you can deep dive into stuff on a video level and also on a channel level. Uh, but there are a lot of things that don't necessarily tell the story that you know um, for the channel and in terms of your goals and things. So of course, I export a lot of that data and I've also created scripts. Uh, so in Google Sheets, you can use JavaScript and you can uh, use the YouTube API and you can pull in. In fact, you can write in multiple languages. I think you can do in Python and PHP in places. Um, and I pull in a lot of the data from the YouTube API about my channel. And from here, I've gone from pretty much the whole history of the channel month by month and I can pull in uh, the views on the channel, the watch time, which is what YouTube measures as a main metric for success. Uh, mm -hmm. So it doesn't actually matter about how many views you get, it's how long people are watching for. And um, the longer you can keep them on the platform, the more um, it benefits YouTube as a platform and then benefits you. Um, you'll also see uh, average viewer duration, and this is something that ties hand in hand with watch time. If you increase, increase the view duration, and you have your videos there in the library, then of course your watch time is going to go up. And we can also see the audience growth um, with subscribers. And then I've created these extra metrics over here, which just show some running totals uh, and things that YouTube doesn't really show, uh, which is a shame. So things like the way that your channel has grown over the years. So I've put in some of these into graphs uh, just because it's, it's nice to see how the audience has grown and where things have changed. Um, unfortunately, yeah. YouTube shows it as a as a weekly or a monthly thing, so it's constantly up and down because it shows the totals rather than the cumulative growth. Um, but this is interesting to see. I can see clear pinpoints of where the channel has reached new audiences uh, and where things have grown and where things have sort of leveled out and the pace hasn't been so great and whatever. Um, but where you might be looking at things on a very, uh, what would it be, a micro level of only seeing the um the the sort of smaller week by week things and you think like oh everything's kind of like flopping or whatever when you look at it on a macro level and you see over the six years you think oh no things are trending upwards things are growing well mm -hmm. and it's you know doing its thing you're just in uh different phases of the channel yeah um, everyone is really impressed with your excel sheets in oh, the really? chat everyone's really blown away by your excel excel sheet skills which i was when i saw that last time you showed it uh to me i was like whoa this is crazy <laughs> and especially with that you can just put in the uh url and it mm -hmm. generates all of these info so um so this is a this is a spreadsheet that i'm most proud of and i've done this um for each year uh, because there is a limitation to Google Sheets with the API it can only pull in uh, 50 videos at a time mm. and uh, thankfully I've well I don't know if it's thankfully or not but I've never actually published more than 50 videos in a year so um, I kind of fit in with what the the API is offering uh, but this is a script where essentially um, I won't run through the details on it because it, it did take about a week or so to create um, but I put in the ID for the video and this is just obviously from the URL and I've got the script that runs in the background and then I can hit update stats or it does it every uh, 15 minutes um, just continuously and this one in particular is the top video uh, top videos for the channel so I've got the top 50 videos and from here from this single thing it starts pulling in from the API the information such as the date it was published, and that's a date that includes time zone and time code, and um, sorry, not time code, uh, pulls in time zone uh, and other things. And from there, you can spit that out and say, okay, let's generate the date, but as only a day. So I can see over the history of the channel, what day of the week have I published on? And I've created uh, conditional formatting that automatically colors it depending on what the, the input is in here. I can see the time that I published as well. Mm -hmm. And so I can work out from here, you know, if there was a particular video that was very successful or it completely flopped, one of the major telling points might just be the time that I published it. Um, I can see the overall views on things. And this is where you'll see the conditional formatting where uh, 
all of these columns, for example, let me just show you conditional formatting, um, you can set a color scale. So for the minimum value uh, of uh, these cells within this column, apply this color uh, for the midpoint and the max color um, here. So therefore, it will show the highest number with the maximum value color, and then it will do a, uh, a gradient all the way through to that minimum color that you set. So this is a great way of easily seeing a spreadsheet that is wild with numbers and you can pinpoint immediately like this stands out to me. Yeah. Why has this video generated more likes per view? And we look at it and we're like, oh, what video is this? This is a 10 minute video of multiple iPhone clips with uh, just the pure visual and sound um, of things. It generated uh, great interest, uh, eight minutes. It seemed to fit well with the audience. It seemed to captivate people, great engagement on comments and things. And as a spreadsheet, this tells me so much. Um, I can see where things are maybe working and where they're not um, purely from a numbers standpoint. Another aspect here is the duration of the video. And I can see these like warm areas of, okay, so I'm, I'm clearly making videos around 12 minutes, 10 minutes. Is that translating? Is that working well on the stats that show it? Or do I need to adjust things differently? Um, of course, this type of analysis only really adds up when you've got a library of things to look at and uh, you've got all that data available to you. But it is those types of things uh, and areas that you need to be looking at in order to consider um, having success on, on the channel, I guess. There's so much more to it. Uh, and this is kind of tying in what we were doing in the first session where we were talking about more of the, the business and um, idea of should you have a channel and, you know, this is once you've got a channel, uh, what do you look for? Um, things like watch time, things like audience retention, how long are people staying on? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a whole multitude of jobs um, yeah. behind it um, that take up a lot of your time, but I get immense, immense enjoyment from it. Um, and also, I guess it's something for people that want to do this, not just as a fun thing to do on the side. Like, obviously, this is something that is a deep dive into how <laughs> can I grow on this platform? How can I um, extend my viewers and show my work to as many people as possible but what i wanted to know is like when did you start really deep diving into the data behind your channel like when did you when were you able to see benefit from looking at that data um kind of immediately if i'm honest um so i started my channel uh so brief history on the channel is i started it uh around the same time that i went freelance uh, in my design work mm -hmm. And uh, one of the first videos that I published was my desk setup video. And it was kind of uh, a bit of a, a chapter moment of, hey, I've set up a new company. I'm going freelance. Here's my desk, by the way. And uh, I set the channel up as a way to promote myself as both a designer and also to get my photography work uh, more in line with, you know, who I am and uh, try and get hired for that. And so it was very much like a promotional piece, the channel, to uh, to promote me and hopefully get hired by clients and uh, get commissioned work and whatever. Uh, the desk set of video did really well um, almost immediately. And we see it's still in the top 50 um, views on the channel. And I think I've linked it. Yep. So I created a link that goes straight to the analytics. Um, so almost immediately, we can see that it just grew. And I didn't really make too many tweaks on this, but this was a video that gave me so much insight to see um, where the uh, where the growth was sort of happening and, and what was you know going on with the audience and whatever. Um, so I started to look into it and I was using the YouTube analytic. I, I didn't have any of my own spreadsheets and whatever, um, but this is something that you can easily get consumed by and mm. that's potentially unhealthy as well. Um, but what I found myself doing is when I was working uh, freelance at places, my lunch breaks and my evenings and weekends were dedicated fully to the channel. So I would spend my lunch breaks, you know, just eating a Boots meal deal or whatever and um, looking over analytics and just seeing, you know, what was happening and, and getting an understanding of things. 
and really just understanding all of this information that was presented to you. Um, so you can go through and you can see audience retention, you know, as the video progresses, you can see clear points where people are clicking more. Um, so here we've got like 30% average view duration um, or 30% of the audience are watching up until this point, but actually a lot of them are skipping ahead into this area. And we can see around the six minute mark. So what happens there? That's where I start to actually assemble the desk and build things together. Uh, so that tells me that people are interested in seeing the product as it comes to life. This tells the story of what the thumbnail shows. Um, mm -hmm. And I arrive at that point, you know, about three quarters of the way into it. But at the same time, a lot of people are stuck around because they enjoyed the fact that this is a build process. Um, man, I look so young here. Yeah, I was <laughs> about to say. <laughs> Uh, it's been a while since I've it's seen this so one. It's so crazy to see, but I think it's so amazing to see how it developed. And the, also, I mean, that's a good thing about a YouTube channel. You can go back and see what yeah, I mean, improvements you made over the last years. Yeah, that, That's what I love about documenting things. I, I think it's such a shame that, um, you know, there are people I know who are older than me or even the same age as me. And, and they look back at moments of their life and they think, I don't have any images of that because mm -hmm. they weren't you know comfortable in front of camera or uh, they just didn't take photos and it's not about sharing it publicly it's just having it for your own record um and i just happened to put these videos out publicly as well <laughs> but i think i would still i mean i still do i film and photo an awful lot every day of stuff that just never gets shared but i do it because it chapter markers things for me yeah. um and yeah it's, it's just great to be able to look back and, and see all these things um, if you do end up putting it on YouTube, at least you get all the stats that tells you about it as well. So you can exactly. nerd out on it. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> um, so amazing. yeah, the, uh, the, the analytics is something I've always shown an interest to, but I, I know it's something that a lot of people are terrified by. Um, mm -hmm. And so this may look very overwhelming. Uh, and YouTube has done a, a good job of updating the studio dashboard to to show you um, various stats and things and present it in a more human-like way. So you'll see that on the um, the overall sort of dashboard, uh, where we go, analytics. Um, so you can see your channel usually gets uh, X amount of views in the last 28 days and yeah. it matches up with what there is. So without having to go through the spreadsheet and say, what do I normally get and what am I getting now? YouTube is just telling you very openly and saying, hey, here's what's currently happening. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that just kind of sits nice and comfortably yeah. on the channel. Um, so it, it's not as intimidating, but the option is always there. You can go advanced mode and you can yeah. really dive into things and you can export your data. You can yeah. cross compare videos to videos. Um, so many options. I love it. That's Thank you so much, because that is, I think for me, not knowing that much about YouTube, just watching a lot of YouTube and occasionally uploading something. I think it's so interesting to see behind the scenes of a big channel on, on YouTube and also to see how much work goes into that, because I think a lot of people assume people just upload something and then by because they're lucky or something, the video goes well and a lot of people watch it, but there's so much work that goes into it even after you've published it. So that's super um, interesting and great insight. Thank you so much. No worries at all. Because there's, uh, there's still so much more I can yeah. share on this, but I know we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, we have one more minute. Um, but I think YouTube just, I don't know. It's just, we opened this box and now there's so much more I want to know about. Because last time I was already like, oh, we can do one more. And now I'm like, oh, my God, is there a third video coming where we talk more about YouTube? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> well, it, it, has, um, uh, it has spurred on an idea um, just going back into Photoshop on things. Uh, yeah. Even this simple document, I've got some clever things happening with nested layer comps uh, in smart Ooh. objects. And, um, <laughs> you know, working with things so that you can be as quick as possible to export an image because... You know, I say it all the time. Everyone hates the boring stuff, so don't make yourself make it do it as quick as possible. Yeah, just get it over with as quick yeah. as possible and as consistent as possible because yeah. consistency is key. That is true. That is true. 
on that note, I think that's a very good ending to this overall YouTube streams that we have been doing. Um, everyone, if you haven't already, go check out Joe's YouTube channel and uh, Instagram account and all all the different social medias where you can follow people. Um, thank you, Joe, so much. It was lovely talking to you. And thank you, everyone, for watching today. I hope you have a lovely rest of the week. We're here on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So also check out the other streams that are coming. Until then, stay safe, wash your hands, and we will be back soon. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you. See you again bye. soon. Bye-bye.